No. No, they said. Now, I know we've had failures before with the government. This is an emergency. We must have a government intervention. We must find somewhere the man who is the best trained in aerodynamics. Get that subsidy to that man and invent that airplane and take the lead in the world where we rightly belong. Two presidents, McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt, got behind that argument. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. Why does federal aid seem to have a reverse Midas touch? Drawing on examples from the nation's past and present, from the fur trade and railroads, to cars and chemicals, to aviation and cylindra, Uncle Sam can't count as a sweeping work of economic history that explains why the federal government cannot and should not pick winners and losers in the private sector. In this episode, we bring you a presentation that was delivered as part of the 2015 Act and Lecture series, featuring American historian Burton Folsom, speaking on his book, Uncle Sam Can't Count. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Good. It's great to be here. Thank you to Chris and to Mike Cook for helping so much to set this up and to Mark for getting me all hooked up here. And special thanks to Anita, my wife and co-author of this book, Uncle Sam Can't Count, which I wanted to talk about today. And yeah, that, that Chris is raising the point, Uncle Sam Can't Count. Uh, can't count what? Well, uh, we're thinking it's in particular of corporate welfare or individual subsidies here. What, we, what Anita and I have done are traced a lot of these subsidies from really from George Washington and the first subsidy to the fur trade, which turned out to be a disaster. Uh, So we look at the failed subsidy with George Washington and the fur trade, and continuing really to Solyndra and the 500 million subsidy for solar cells. And it occurred to Anita and me that, that these subsidies often come in and there's never any debate. It's like, hey, here's a good idea. Let's have a subsidy for the idea. That will make it work better. But there's no discussion of what is the past history of subsidies. Do they work? Are they sometimes counterproductive? And so I thought it would be good to trace a lot of these government subsidies in the 1800s and even into the 1900s to look at these subsidies and the current as well. Now, what I want to do is get you thinking of one of our earlier subsidies. And by the way, most of these are, are not found anywhere in a textbook. The, tele, the, the subsidy with the telegraph. Now, you look at your, today, most of us communicate, right? With some kind of cell phone or iPhone. And Apple sold, what, 200 million of these recently? I mean, in a, in a year or two's time. So we have a huge market for iPhones. And we don't think very much of communicating via email or text message with somebody who might be in Europe uh, thousands of miles away. It's a way of life to us that you have that instant sort of communication. You have to back that up and look at each phase of that. And you go back, I mean, even to the telephone in the 1870s, an early example of communicating with someone else far away, out of reach of your voice. But telegraph is the step even before that. You go back to the 1840s. 1830s when it was invented, 1840s put into operation. If you think about most of human history, if you didn't have direct contact with someone, then you were not able to communicate with them. None of this idea that somebody a few miles away, oh, I suppose smoke signals or something, you know, you might, primitive. But basically not. The idea that Samuel Morse had when he developed 
the what he called elect electromagnetic telegraphy. The idea is that you have wires, and on a wire, if you tap an impulse on a wire, that impulse can then reverberate, and there are ways that you can keep that reverberation going. And so the idea is that on a wire, you could tap something, and that the signal on that tap could be heard miles away. He developed the Morse code system because you're going to have a dot or a dash, right? A dot or a dash, and then a space in between. And letters would be coded with these dots and dashes. And through those dots and dashes, you'd have somebody at the other end of the wire, and you could actually communicate a message. It just sounds so primitive to us compared with sending a text message that it's almost impossible to believe. But 180 years ago, that was state of the art. And it was absolutely fantastic. And the idea, when, when he had this, he got a government subsidy. And building the wires, because he had to figure out, should I do the wiring underground or above ground? They ended up doing it above ground. It was hard. There are problems with the underground. So it's like a telephone wire almost we, we, today. You wire it, and we did our first telegraph system from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland. 40 miles, 40 miles of wire. And Morris believed the government ought to be involved because this is so big. It's so big. It, the implications of this kind of communications were so vast. It's something that could not be trusted in the hands of private individuals. It had to be government owned. Uh, we have a quote in, in an, uh, Uncle Sam Can't Count from the first postmaster general who was commenting on this. And he said this, the telegraph, because this is major invention, 1840s, and the telegraph, so powerful for good or evil, cannot with safety to the people be left in the hands of private individuals uncontrolled by law. That's, the, <laughs> that's 180 years ago. You know, we think of the idea of the government intervention. We were, st our impulse back in 50 years after George Washington's presidency was, this is so vast, the implications are that we have to have the government controlling it. People can't quite be trusted with something this huge. They recognized the implications of this at the time. So the government was going to own it, and it was also good because the government then gets the profits, Right? I mean, like if the government owned all the internet and we, we, the government would be able to make profits, in theory at least, from the internet. Well, that's the idea here too. Now, to use the wire from Washington to Baltimore, you had to have a, you had to pay a fee by the letters, the words you had, and you had a fee assessment. So you could do this communication. You had to pay a fee. The government was going to get the money because it could not be safely left in the hand of private individuals. You would be interested. It's the, the, the telegraph, the first message sent in 1844, by the way, which was out of Scripture, what hath God wrought? You know, wow, what's this all about? This is so amazing. And then you get to 1845, and commercial use of the telegraph is out there, and the government gets it all. Well, what we found was kind of interesting. The first few months, the expenses for keeping up the wire, that because you had to have a telegrapher in, somebody who could do Morse code in Baltimore, and somebody in Washington. And if there was any repair of the line that needed to be done, that had to be built into your costs. So you had that at your cost end, and of course you're charging for the messages. The first several months that the government owned the telegraph, the revenue was here, and the costs were six times greater. In other words, they were losing money. And they thought, well, this is going to change in the next few months. It's bound to as people get to know about it. And it did change. By the end of the first year, the costs exceeded revenue by 10 to 1. <laughs> and then we heard an interesting decision from the Polk administration. We are going to privatize the telegraph. Now, 
it now can perhaps be left in the hands of individuals. All of these losses caused the, Reven the Telegraph to be privatized. Uh, it, it's interesting, by the way, looking at what they were charging for. One of the big revenue sources that the government had was from people playing chess in Baltimore and Washington. And one guy would move, and the next guy would give his counter move, and they'd have a board there. And so I guess the revenue, the chess, uh, we didn't have a chess festival or enough going on. So the government sold it, and the next year it will be privatized. Sold to Ezra, Ezra Cornell, founder of Cornell University, starts Western Union. Other people get in the telegraph business as well. Ezra Cornell says, I think that we can do better than this. And immediately he connects wires from Baltimore to Philadelphia to New York. And then we have financial information going back and forth. And people can tap into Wall Street. So that information is sold and becomes part of the telegraph system. We have weather reports that come from community to community. We have law and order police are able to trace the whereabouts of criminals by sending updates on descriptions of the criminals over the telegraph. And we have also, one of the big sources was people trying to get letters of recommendation from someone. See, people in New York are hiring. You say, I'm from Philadelphia. Well, can we check on references? And we can do that over the telegraph. It becomes a very important tool of business. And it becomes so overwhelmingly profitable that Western Union expands the telegraph wire all around the country. And in six years, we go from 40 miles to 23,000 miles of telegraph wire, a profitable company. In the next decade, it goes across the country to San Francisco. Then we have a transatlantic cable that's going to bring news to Europe. Start with England first and then through to Europe. So it's, we're going to be able to connect the world. Within 20 years after the privatization of the telegraph, we have the world connected through it. The government had it for one year and lost money steadily every year, increasing as the year went on. Right away, that's very interesting. And you sit there and you think, why was the government such a failure and private enterprise so successful? I'd like to think about the, you know, part of it is you reach a point where you say, well, the guy, the bureaucrats are incompetent. I'd like to, and I mean, I don't want to argue vociferously with that, but I want to just back it up a little bit and say, you know, let's look at the incentives that are there for Ezra Cornell and the incentives are, that are there for the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats in Washington running the telegraph are paid a salary. They have every incentive to try to collect at one end and collect at the other end, but they have no incentive to innovate because if they would have expanded the wire, they would have been fired maybe if it didn't work. And they don't know if, really if it's going to work. It's not working as it is to Baltimore. And they have no incentive to innovate and figure out new uses for the telegraph. Because again, you have a flat salary regardless. Ezra Cornell had every incentive to try to think, how can I make use of people being able to communicate across the country? Once he began to think of ideas, weather reports from one area to another, criminals, as we said, all the financial implications of all of this. When all of that happened, he began to develop new uses of the wire, the advertising, and you had satisfied customers. The costs dropped, by the way, considerably. Within 10 years, he was charging much less than the government was charging during the year the government had the telegraph. The incentive structure was such that when the government owned it, it could not, something that great and momentous was unprofitable. In the hands of private citizens, it was wonderful because the incentives were so very different. It's interesting to me that I know not a textbook that I have ever read in American history that tells that story.
Not one. Now, the point is, and that's just our first example. There are going to be three. I'll do, I want to do some, one on the railroads and one on the airplane, too. But I, I say that simply to say, if we don't understand what happened in our past and what worked, what the incentive structure is that we can all discuss, how can we make decisions in the future that will uh, frugally and satisfactorily spend taxpayer dollars? You can't just assume, oh, the government ought to own this. Because what we've seen historically from this example of the first source of communications that are beyond person-to-person -person communications at a face-to-face -face level. This first example, a disaster by the government, incredible success by a private owner. You go to phase two, I want to look 20 years later at the transcontinental railroads. Because here you have a system with the Union Pacific, and we're going to try to connect the country. You have the Union Pacific in Nebraska, and we're going to try to connect California out here and send the Union Pacific out there to California to tie the country from coast to coast. We have the eastern half of the United States connected, but from Nebraska out to California, no connections. So we build from Omaha out to Sacramento, California. And the idea we thought, hey, incentives are important, right? See, we're trying to get learning curve here for government. So let's subsidize two companies. The Central Pacific out west and have them go east, and then have the Union Pacific have them heading out. And then the two will meet. And we'll pay subsidies by the mile. And we'll even pay more subsidies to go over hilly land or mountainous land. What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. Think about this, because the, the, the major subject I, I had on the telegraph was incentives. You're paying by the mile for the Union Pacific to go westward. Would it surprise you terribly if I told you that the route through Nebraska that the Union Pacific took looked something like this? We start in Omaha. <laughs> we paid by the mile, didn't we? Woo, we're taking lots of miles here. I talked about this one time before I was told a distinguished group of businessmen. And I thought, well, I'm going to talk about this. And a guy frantically at the end raised his hand and said, he put his hands on his hips. He says, I worked for the Union Pacific my whole life. And everybody was turning around to look at what the fount of wisdom was going to say. And he said, and I want you to know something. They're still trying to straighten that railroad out. <laughs> <laughs> and it is hard because once, see, once you do this, towns get set in, right? And then the towns have every incentive not to want any redoing of the railroad away from their towns. And so it is, it is hard to redo a railroad once it's like that. Well, obviously, you, you had a, a, and you think, well, my gosh, what happens when we get to the mountains? Simple. Instead of looking, well, I mean, mountains, as you know, driving uphill is terribly wasteful, as we know, just driving cars on gas. And you reach a certain level of incline and you can't even do it. And so you want to get as flat a grade as you can. So anybody approaching a mountain, a mountain goes up, but it does go down. There's usually a flat area somewhere that you might be able to weave your way through a mountain. But it takes a little bit of work. Now, see, from the Union Pacific, again, look at incentives. If they're sitting there trying to figure out how that flat grade is through the Rocky Mountains, the Central Pacific is busy coming at them from the other end making all that money. So they thought the best thing we can do is find the levelest grade we can and just quick go through. Even though it's terribly high up, even though, by the way, it was going to have to be completely rebuilt later after the Union Pacific went bankrupt, you did a terrible grade, you got through the mountains, and then you're back going on toward the Central Pacific. See, we're making more money. Now we can just go merrily along through the West. As the two railroads began to get close to each other, 
Okay. Now we're getting close. I, I, I should mention we had the invention of dynamite, which was going to be helpful to get through hilly area. You blow a hill open, and then you can get a flat grade through with your railroad. The Union Pacific could have written a book, Dynamite, Its Uses and Abuses. <laughs> One of the abuses we discovered was sneaking over to the, Union Pacific, to the Central Pacific in the middle of the night and blowing their track up. <laughs> And then talking with the government bureaucrat who's there and say, they got credit for mileage and it isn't even there anymore. <laughs> While the Union Pacific just chugs along. I have a question for you here that I've never had a student miss. What do you think the Central Pacific did about this? A turn the other cheek. <laughs> B, go, aw shucks. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. C, use dynamite on the Union Pacific Railroad in the middle of the night <laughs> and their track. Yes. We're going to have track blown up against the Union Pacific by the Central Pacific. So both groups are blowing each other's track up so you can't get any progress of the railroad because they're taking the subsidy money, buying dynamite, and blowing up the other person's track. <laughs> Congress had to get involved and say, nobody, nobody gets any subsidy. If you keep blowing each other up, it's over. <laughs> so now the two railroads can't blow each other up anymore, their track up, so here they come, out west. They refuse to meet. They parallel each other, both claiming money for the mileage which they paralleled. Congress has to get involved again. No, they say, you're going to meet at Promontory Point, Utah. Nobody gets any mileage past Promontory Point. So they finally met. They connected the track. They popped in the golden spike, both the leader of the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific took a hammer, got a chance to take a jackhammer on the golden spike. They swung and missed. <laughs> a foreman cranked in the golden spike, and finally, after doing so, somebody stole the golden spike. <laughs> but it was quickly, I'm happy to report, recovered. And so we had that as the story of our first transcontinental railroad. It cost $60 million, $60 million to pay those subsidies. Plus, we gave free land to both railroads on both sides of the track, uh, pieces of it here and there. And so our national, you know, I said $60 million. It's like, everybody, oh, ho oh, hum, $60, $60 million was our national debt when we began building the railroad. In, in 1860, really, when we first began passing the bills for it, our whole national debt was $60 million, and we paid $60 million for that railroad, which had to be completely rebuilt on the Union Pacific side because of the mountain problem. Now, somebody could say, well, that's the only way you're going to get across is to do something like that, except that James J. Hill, an immigrant, a one-eyed immigrant... <laughs> who was missing an eye from a bow and arrow accident as a young kid, came along in St. Paul, Minnesota and said, this is stupid. And he began building a transcontinental railroad from St. Paul westward to Seattle, Washington. And he did it with no federal funds. This is costing zero, the taxpayer. And he's building and he's making the agricultural land profitable by encouraging farming out in the Dakotas and Montana and sending the crops back and forth. He gets to Montana and he develops the copper industry in Montana. He gets out west to all those trees and he goes up to his neighbor in St. Paul, Frederick Warehouser, and says, I have an idea where you might be able to make some money. <laughs> Buy some of that timber land out in Washington, and I'll give you discounts taking the timber land back east to build houses in this new country of ours. And so they do that. 
And Hill builds that railroad with zero federal funds. One of the first things I did when I was researching this is I thought, how did he get through the Rocky Mountains? Because notice the incentives. The incentive for the Union Pacific to do this, to rush through the mountains with a poor grade, an uphill grade. The incentives are very different when it's your own money and your own railroad. You see Hill slowly and methodically. It was a slower built railroad than the Union Pacific, but it was done methodically. And when he got to the mountain, he said, how do I get through? He went back to the journals of Lewis and Clark because he said, how did they get through? They're the first ones we know of who made it out west. And he heard, he read in the journal, they were talking about the Marias Pass. And he hired an Indian guide. He had all sorts of people to find this Marias Pass. They did. It was a fairly flat grade. He bought right away through the Marias Pass, and he had a flat grade through the Rockies. Hill used to laugh because in the panic of 1893, when the other transcontinentals were going bankrupt, and some of them going out of business and having to be resold, his company was making an 8 to 10 profit, percent profit every year. He said, I have the best built transcontinental in the company, in the country, the only one that's profitable. I have a short track. I don't have to use fuel going through the country. I, I simply have the best railroad maybe in the country. It was privately built. The only transcontinental not to go broke in the panic of 1893 just happened to be the only one that was not federally funded. So what I'm suggesting here, there's a, an issue with incentives and the problems created with a government subsidy in the P Department of Incentives, and also that it could be counterproductive. Not just that it didn't work, but that it's actually counterproductive. You're not getting a product that's very workable at all under that system. And in fact, it gets worse because the Union Pacific got so desperate because the federal investigations came in that they started trying to buy off the investigators with stock, free stock. That was exposed. We had a congressman who was censured and kicked out of Congress for taking the stock. It created an atmosphere of corruption because the government subsidy also had the effect of creating political corruption by those trying to protect their subsidy. Interesting. Those two items, telegraph and railroad, are worthy of discussion. When anybody considers maybe we ought to subsidize something, those two come to mind. Now, I want to say something because there's a, there's a bright spot. <laughs> there's a bright, get ready for a bright spot. The transcontinental railroad disaster shook up many American politicians and many Americans. And the end result of this shakeup was that we said, you know what, we want to catch up with England and the European countries in economic growth. But it's obviously not working doing it through subsidies. The United States will rise and fall on the basis of our free markets and entrepreneurs who can step up and do something rather than a government subsidy. We spent what, what is sometimes called the Gilded Age, the late 1800s, with virtually zero subsidies, occasional protective tariffs here and there, but one of the freest times in American history. It was the time of American triumph in oil. No subsidies for Rockefeller. American triumph in steel. No subsidies for Carnegie, the largest steel company in the world, Andrew Carnegie, eventually sold out for U.S. Steel, to U.S. Steel. Chemical industries, Dow Chemical, others began to catch on, do real well. All of that is that triumph of American industry is without federal subsidies. And we then also had... After the, from the year after the Civil War, 1866, we had 28, this is fun to say, 28 straight years with, with surpluses in the government that outdid our government spending. 28 straight years of budget surpluses in which we knocked off two-thirds of the entire federal debt and grew to be the dominant economic power in the world in those industries that I just named. Wow! Learning curve! Can I say it one more time? <laughs> 28 straight years of budget surpluses over expenditures, and we cut two-thirds of our national debt off, and we grew to be the greatest economic power in the world during those years. 
And some of you, I can see the wheels going, what changed that? <laughs> An interesting situation, my last example, the airplane. <laughs> Listen to this. The interventionists have been blown out. They're ready to come back. And listen to this argument. We had people observing. The French and the Germans and the British are experimenting with flight. Gliders, other kinds of experiments. They are publishing journals on aerodynamics. If we sit back and just wait for the free market to send along someone who will decide to try to invent an airplane, we'll be sitting there while Germany invents one, and then they're going to come over and drop bombs on the United States, just come right over here, boom! Then what will you do? We're waiting for free markets to come along and help us so that we can catch up with you. Well, that's nice if you still have a city that hasn't been bombed out. No. No, they said. Now, I know we've had failures before with the government. This is an emergency. We must have a government intervention. We must find somewhere the man who is the best trained in aerodynamics. Get that subsidy to that man and invent that airplane and take the lead in the world where we rightly belong. Two presidents, McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt, got behind that argument. The search was not a long one because we had one person who towered over others. Sam, in, in the area of aerodynamics, Samuel Langley, head of the Smithsonian Institution. He was an inventor. He had inventions to his credit. He was an expert scientist, which is how he got his job as head of the Smithsonian Institution. He had already experimented with aerodynamics in that he had taken a miniature plane, put a small engine on it, and had it flown over the Potomac River in Washington in the 1890s. He received honorary degrees from Harvard, Yale, Oxford, and Cambridge. He had written a book called Experiments in Aerodynamics, which was considered the go-to book for those interested in inventing an airplane. Samuel Langley was the man the United States looked to in this time of need. Samuel Langley, he had an entourage that always followed him. He walked and he had people following, attending to his every need. He showed up in Washington and said, yes, I will agree to receive a subsidy. <laughs> that was a comforting thought. We decided to give him two subsidized attempts. He said the first would probably work, but it was good to have a backup in case it didn't. And so Langley is going to be work full time. In a, it, he actually does some of his duties on the side, but we'll be mainly working on inventing the airplane with a federal subsidy. And the invention is underway. He gets a, a, a pilot, hires, the pilot has to be Ivy League. It was from Cornell. And so he then had to build the plane. And naturally he was explaining to reporters his theories of flight. Because uh, some of the reporters found it a bit unusual. It, we, would, we would think, well, he's got some runway or something somewhere. No, there was no runway involved. He had a houseboat in the middle of the Potomac. <laughs> and people were asking him about this, and he said, here's, here's the way flight works. I mean, as the innovator and the leader, I can explain it. I have this houseboat, and I'm going to put the airplane on the houseboat. <laughs> then I have a catapult device, like a huge rubber band. <laughs> we're going to pull the airplane back. <laughs> then we're going to launch it right out. 
And when he was asked to explain why his theory of flight led him in that direction, he said this. He said, think about it is, is like ice skating. You know, you're ice skating. I mean, this is good in western Michigan and all this. You're ice skating along. And he said, do you notice if you're on a sheet of ice and it may be a little thin, you'll be skating along. And if you come to a stop, you fall in. He says, I've learned from observing that. And what I've learned is you put the engine is critical. You put the engine on the airplane and then you fly it in the air. And as long as you're going, (laughs) right, as long as you're going, you just keep flying. So the key element here is the engine because that engine will propel you through the air and keep the flight going. He even had his pilot Uh, the Cornell guy, they had a compass sewn into his pants so that he could see whether he's going north, east, or west. And Langley gave him the instructions, try to keep your first flight limited to five minutes or ten minutes, if possible. And so we had a 21-gun salute to announce to everybody in D.C., the flight is at hand. And the reporters were out on the Potomac, and they were watching, and all of a sudden, the catapult is pulled back, the airplane's in there, the pilot's in there too, it's cranked back, boom! You know, in looking through dozens of newspapers, you know, trying to, w- the witnesses of this, I couldn't find one that beat really the description of the Washington Post, the, the, the newspaper of record right there. You know, they had their reporters there. 13 words. <laughs> Here are the 13 words. Any stout boy of 15 could have skimmed an oyster shell much further. (laughs) What inspired me was the San Francisco Chronicle said this. The destruction of Langley's machine should put an end to congressional appropriations of any kind in every field of experiments which properly belongs to private enterprise. Wow. We need to show that to Congressman Pelosi and others out there in San Francisco. Very good. You can see the debate coming along here. And Langley, hey, 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 everybody. A slight mishap, which happens in the field of invention, as those of us who have experience in this field know. Flight number two will be different. They fished out the pilot from the first one, and he agreed to go in and do it a second time. And they put him in. And on December 8th, 1903, they pull back the catapult device flies out again crash identical most people said it never went an inch that's why I kept getting he says it never went an inch beyond what the force of the catapult pushed it there was no flight the comments this time got a little bit uglier (laughs) the Boston Herald said this Professor Langley needs to give up airplanes and try his hand at submarines. (laughs) The New York Times said this. The problem is it is too complicated to figure this thing out. I think we will finally conquer flight I do think it will happen, but probably not until mathematicians and engineers work on this task for about one million years. (laughs) The New York Times turned out to be off in its estimate. 
by 999,999 years and 356 days. Nine days after Langley's flight, the Wright brothers, two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, with no college education and $2,000 of their own money, went to test the wind patterns in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And they tried, they said the engine theory is not good. They like the glider theory that you watch birds and you build gliders that can, that can move. They had a rudder and they had Orville or Wilbur. One of them would be on the back of the plane operating the rudder with his feet, operating wings and, and being able to curve the wings uh, with, with his hands. And then they put the engine on last. And they managed, in their first attempt, to fly 59 seconds. They perfected that as the days went on, years went on, because they wanted to use it for commercial purposes. And they said, I think we can make this profitable, obviously, unless somebody has a flight that's a very short flight. 59 seconds isn't going to be commercially profitable. So they were able, to, outside of Dayton, Ohio, their hometown, they developed, finally, the a, a procedure where they could improve their product. They called the, the, they had the Wright Flyer 1, the first one, then the Wright Flyer 2, Wright Flyer 3 with improvements. And they had it so it could go up for two hours. And then they were ready to sell it to the U.S. government for $25,000, a lot of money at the time. And the U.S. government is sitting there with this offer of the Wright Brothers plane for $25,000. And you might be interested because when this was happening, uh, Samuel Langley came in and his friends and said, he needs another chance. <laughs> Listen to this argument that one of Langley's friends made, Octave Chanute. Langley's requesting 25000 quote, for a new launching apparatus and a slight change in the aerodrome to bring the experiments to a successful conclusion. He's supported by Octave Chanute, who says, and Alexander Graham Bell supported this. And Chanute said, to do otherwise than give Langley this subsidy, quote, would be to confess that the War Department did not know what it was about in providing funds in the first place. <laughs> Woo. So we could, and Langley requested also $25,000. Uh, and then we had a third possibility that came into play. The French offered to sell us a, what we would call it today, but it was hydrogen, then a helium balloon. They said, this is the wave of the future, not those metallic contraptions. You get a balloon up, then you go over with the balloon and drop things on people. The balloon is the technology of the future. We had a choice between the airplane, uh, uh, built by the Wright brothers, or uh, try Langley again, or buy a balloon. And I have a question for you. <laughs> Which of these do you think they chose? How many think, we'll take a vote. How many think they bought the Wright Brothers plane for $25,000? That's the most cynical crowd I've ever spoken to. <laughs> you mean not one? No one. I'm looking out. Did I miss somebody? Well, we do have one. Hey, let's hear it. <laughs> he believes that they did the right, brothers. That's good. How many think they gave Langley the subsidy? Oh, look at that. How many think they bought the balloon? Okay, the balloon's a close second. But most, the majority here, or at least a plurality, thinks that they bought, they funded Langley for a third subsidy, for a third flight. Isn't that something? In this case, <laughs> the majority is wrong. Shame on you. It's wrong. They did not give Langley the subsidy. And one congressman even said, the only thing you made fly was congressional money. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
they bought the balloon. <laughs> the answer is the balloon. <laughs> now, we got suspicious when the French came in and asked Wilbur Wright to come over that they wanted to buy the airplane. <laughs> That's where we got very suspicious. And so while they were buying, having Wilbur Wright do a test flight that was amazing and they wanted to buy it, we were having Orville Wright, uh, Orville Wright in Fort Myer, Virginia, do a test flight for the military. And he, of course, was up for a long time. And so the government ended up saying, well, we're not just going to let the French buy it. We're going to buy it, too. So the United States did buy the Wright Flyer after initially buying the balloon. And we do begin with our War Department by an arsenal of airplanes. We had the Wright brothers there all the time, and Langley's subsidy was wasted. Again, Langley's incentives were to procure government money, not necessarily to run a successful flight. The Wright brothers, thinking of the commercial possibilities, were very, very successful. I'd merely like to say in closing, we need to understand, because you say, what can be done about this? You need to understand the historical examples, number one. You cannot come into a debate on should we fund something especially with the expenses of this magnitude. If you look at corporate welfare and, and, and individual welfare are the two largest items in the federal budget for the last 50 years. We need to, before any corporate subsidies, any individual subsidies, what is the track record? Let's discuss it and debate it and bring it into the conversation. I've never seen these. Sometimes I see the transcontinentals. But of the three examples I gave, two are absolutely invisible in almost all American history textbooks. I didn't know them myself and I had a PhD in American economic history. <laughs> and I don't think my professors were saying, oh, quite shut up on the airplane, Folsom's coming. <laughs> I don't think they knew. <laughs> it never entered into the culture of the conversation in economic history and PhD programs to discuss it. They didn't know it. They just went into a memory hole. And I think it's fun, Anita and I do in our writing, to pull things out of the memory hole and bring them back to public attention so that good decisions can be made. So number one, we need to understand that the past, get good information in there. And then number two, I think we just need to have an, an appreciation for the Constitution. And the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8 is very limiting to what the federal government can be involved in because the founders knew the kind of politics that can be played, the kinds of misinformation that can come about when we have politicians taking money and taxpayer money and allocating it as they see fit. So a constitutional revival plus an information revival, I think, would be the starting points to getting better public policy, which is what... Acton Institute, a lot of what Acton Institute is all about, getting that better uh, public policy and achieving better results in this country, diminished debt, and more effective economic development. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Folsom. We, it's about... Uh, about 10 to 1, and we do have about 15 minutes for some questions. So if you have a question, uh, lots of questions. I believe, it was, I believe it was on 60 minute segment this past Sunday um, about the rare earth minerals, as they're called. That rare earth minerals? Yeah. Okay. And they're very essential to a lot of things, including our military weaponry. And we only have one place in California that is currently producing them, and that company is not making money. The Chinese, uh, I thought the Chinese had the monopoly because they're, they only had that rare earth. But it turns out that they undersold us by their usual methods. Now, I consider that to be extremely important. I'm sure that all the examples you gave were also considered to be extremely important for a number of uh, reasons. So how would we, uh, without subsidizing, encourage uh, private enterprise to take up that cause and, and produce more in the US? Because I understand there these so-called Rare earth minerals do exist in the United States. Well, I, I don't know anything about it, assuming that it's important. 
The private enterprise route, I still think, is a great way to do it. Often enterprises start and they're unprofitable, and it's just a matter of time before we get people who can figure out uh, how, to, how to make money on it and how to do it right. I mean, I use the airplane, obviously, is an example. There are others as well. Uh, we had, we had uh, I mentioned the subsidies to the fur company. We started out with a government company. It was not innovative. The innovations came with John Jacob Astor, who had his agents living with the Indians and the fur traders rather than having the Indians go 50 miles to an, a fort to do trading with furs. In other words, there are all sorts of ways to cut costs and be innovative. Once you establish the profitability of your product, and then you get a certain amount of innovation, I think you can have a successful result. Yeah, Anita, go ahead. Just, just point out, you have the microphone on you first. Okay. federal regulations and the EPA has really hampered all of that. Okay. Yeah, Anita was saying, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> The, the, the EPA, of course, has, uh, we have a variety of EPA regulations that uh, restrict what can be done in mining, and perhaps there needs to be a lot of work there. You can't, uh, uh, another barrier to the effectiveness of private enterprises often. So I, w I would look for those tools. Well, that's yeah. true of that one plant in California. <laughs> There you go. My first question, I'm, I'm glad the EPA came up. Is there a better way, what's the, the right way to go about keeping our environment clean than the uh, command and control system that we have? Right, keep in mind that, that uh, pollution is inefficient. And this isn't to say there isn't a role for the state of some kind here, but it's to say pollution represents an inefficiency, it's a waste. How many have noticed, uh, those of you who are as old as I am, that, that cans for canned drinks are thinner than they once were? And that thin is right, it's waste. If you have thick cans, you have waste. On cartons of milk, the, the plastic is thinner than it used to be. There are all sorts of devices now that we have, anti-pollution devices, that can capture some of the waste and reuse some of it. And so there are actually some market incentives to try to cure uh, various problems of this type. And so I, I would say the, the market is often able to do a lot better than has been suggested. The problem has been historically with regulation is that you, it, it, back in the English system of common law, if somebody were dropping something into the river that wasn't right, you, there were ways that you could track that down and address that improper uh, material that was being dumped into the, the river. And uh, the EPA tends to go with blanket decisions. Like you can't drop anything at any time into the river when actually that might be going a little bit too far. So the common law tends to work better than the EPA in any case. So I'd say markets and common law have a better track record than the EPA. Yeah. Yes, another question. I had a couple observations and I just wondered if you'd comment on them. I used to work for the Department of Corrections for three years here in the state, and uh, okay. I guess uh, two things I noticed when I was there. One was the culture is extremely conservative, and I don't mean that politically. I mean not um, very, very risk averse. So a lot of the sayings that you would hear as a newbie, I would say, well, don't do that. You don't want to die on that hill, meaning don't take that chance. You know, uh, the nail that sticks out gets hammered, and no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and then the other thing I noticed was um, I was a sales rep, so. In September, it was the year end, and we would be busy as all get out. That was our busiest month of the year because everyone was trying to spend down their budgets. Because if you had money left over at the end of the year, yeah. you didn't get it next year. So the incentive was always to spend to the last penny. And those are mundane observations compared to what you're talking about, but I just wondered if you had anything to say about that. Right, and it, it, you, you make some good points about the inefficiencies of government operation. I don't know how this private prison reform is going to work, but we're experimenting with some of that, too, because a lot of states have these huge budgets for corrections, and they're tremendously overcrowded, and it costs twenty-five, sometimes $35,000 a year to house an inmate. And we're beginning to understand maybe private, privatizing that would be more effective. And so in Texas and other places, we're getting some experiments, and so we might be able to get some help there. Privatization, as we saw in the Telegraph, it's, it's not always the best solution, but it's often one that needs to be looked at. Yeah. 
Thank you for your question. Um, Dr. Folsom, the students at Hillsdale are very fortunate to have you. Um, you they, they don't always say so, but I'll, <laughs> I, I thank you of for saying so. Of course not. Um, <laughs> you twice referenced textbooks and the lack of narrative, um, particularly when it comes to private sector versus government. Yes. And I wondered when you and Anita were going to write a textbook for high school students <laughs> and reassert the American narrative. <laughs> thank you. You know, I'll tell you, that's th this textbook issue is an important one. I like Larry Schweikart's uh, book, Patriots History of the American People. Is that right? Patriots, Patriots History of the United States. I should say P-H-U-S-A. Patriots History of the United States. Tom Woods also has a politically incorrect guide to American history, which is much shorter and, and very interesting and I think usable as well. I think we can get reduced versions of those kinds of books. I, that's, uh, that's very important. The textbook issue is important and some inroads have been made on that and I hope will continue to be made because it is very important. <coughs> How do you counter the argument uh, about NASA that you have to have government uh, involved in space travel and uh, uh, innovation related to a lot of yeah. products that uh, the private sector couldn't afford to develop? Yeah, the, uh, the argument of NASA, some of the argument is basically this. It's so big that it has to be done by government. This would be helpful if you saw a lot of good examples that big things were done by government were done well, yeah. like Obamacare. Right? In other words, it's so big, it has to be done by government. And that, but, but naturally, the bigness creates a certain barrier to entry, as the economists say, because it's going to take a lot of capital. Now, I think it's interesting that Elon Musk is talking about exploring space. And so the private enterprise is, is making some inroads on this. Uh, NASA, of course, is located in Houston. And part of that was because Senator Johnson... Lyndon Johnson was from Texas, so you naturally bring it into Houston. You can see some of this working. Some of, the, some of the NASA projects have been done very well. Occasionally, you will see projects that are done well if you get the right leadership and you get the, uh, of the project and you get the right, the leader has the sense of who to bring in. Very rarely do you see a situation where that occurs, where you have the right leader and then that leader has the incentive to bring the right people in and try to do something. But when you can get that in rare examples, you sometimes can have an effective result. And I think the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, would fall into that. But the fact that we're sitting there on fingers, right? Well, let's see, maybe NASA, maybe the atomic bomb, and we still have fingers that aren't raised, that suggests when we have the array of subsidies that it's a rarity, when that happens. But I think bring, bring those into the conversation, too, and say, hey, it's interesting. We've had some that seem to have done a little, and those aren't exactly corporate subsidies either, but we've had some intervention that seems to have worked better than others, and that, that, that's a good project. Why does sometimes it seem to work? Usually it doesn't, and so the default position ought to be free markets, and I think Elon Musk is going to I hope, show in the next decade or so that that is an opportunity for markets to work out as well. Professor? You, you seem to infer, uh, especially, uh, yeah. especially with the railroad, about the corruption involved in this. Yes. Do any of your books or can you uh, talk about or document kind of the level of corruption in many of these subsidies? Um, yes. That, when I wrote the book, and Anita and I wrote FDR Goes to War together, and we see a lot of it in World War II. But in the New Deal, I wrote the book New Deal or Raw Deal. And what impressed me about the 1930s, first of all, you start, you have bad unemployment, and then it gets worse in some ways. It goes up and down. But in 1939, almost eight years into Roosevelt's administration, he had 20.7% unemployment. And we doubled the national debt. And some of that is because of the politics. The subsidies don't work. Like the WPA, Works Progress Administration, you subsidize road building. Well, immediately, the states that were Democrat states or swing states got the most money. And so, and, and they're saying, uh, when, when you had Frank Haig, who was in charge of the WPA in New Jersey, he was the di director. It had... WPA headquarters, he's in there with an office and a phone, and it was said that he never, 
when he would answer the phone at the WPA headquarters, the president, he always answered the phone, Democratic headquarters. <laughs> because that's what you had to be to get in on the WPA. And during October, you didn't do road building. You passed out pamphlets and rang doorbells for Franklin Roosevelt. And thus, that helps explain how Franklin Roosevelt in 1936 can be sitting there with 15, 16% unemployment. No president has ever tried to run for re-election with unemployment that high. And he won in the Electoral College 523 to 8. That election was important because it designates a new era. We take the taxpayers' money, we allocate it cleverly to swing states, to re reward, reward people who have supported us, we punish those who haven't by giving them nothing and then using the money to come in and help a candidate run for re-election against them. A new political era was born immediately, which is interesting because the Great Depression is when the first big burst of government came in. It was under the very president that it came in. The, it was politicized right away. Yeah. Dr. Folsom, uh, you're great at storytelling and uh which is what history at its core in many ways is it it gives its it gives a culture its its stories and how in our culture today a lot of these stories that people kind of imbibe come through the big screen and through hbo series and type of specials yeah, like that right, right. how do you get uh these stories uh, on the big screen, you know, for instance, with the, the airplane um, development, would that would be a great storyline and people would laugh at it. And um, but it would also be uh, overcoming with the Wright brothers at the same. I mean, th these are just stories that just people would just eat up. And um, how do you get that on the big screen? How do you tell these stories on a bigger level um, than, let's yeah. say, an auditorium here? Well, uh, yeah, I think that that's very important and can be done. And Anita and I have often said that the Wright brothers, to use your example, was a great one. Anita insisted when we were writing that chapter, she said, we've got to convey, because it would be so good, you can see it graphically, what the Wright brothers, who they were working with. She, Anita likes to make the point, they dressed up in suits out there at Kitty Hawk because they wanted to make, they're sons of, minister, of a minister. They wanted to make a good impression on the local people. That they would, and the local people then supported them by helping them carry their airplane up the hill because they were practicing with gliders. And Anita has the quote from Johnny Moore after he, he helped them bring the first plane that actually flew up the hill. And he was running into town to tell them about it afterwards. And I think his line was, damned if they ain't flew. <laughs> So, so, I, I mean, the, the, the contrast is fascinating. You've got Langley with nothing but Ivy League and all of this government money. And then the Wright brothers, with 2,000 of their own money, never went to college. They're bicycle mechanics out in Dayton with this crowd of people in Kitty Hawk, and they pull it off. Well, a lot of people are embarrassed by that conclusion, <laughs> right? And it's an embarrassing conclusion, and it doesn't promote the idea that government solves problems. So you have to get filmmakers that are committed to telling the story as it happened. <laughs> and that's not easy. But we have to, we've seen some of this done. And I like, in fact, what the Acton Institute has done with their poverty cure videos. They go out and do just what you said. They'll interview people to see what works in, in various parts of Af Africa and elsewhere that the individual, not government subsidies coming in, they're a disaster. But you get individuals who can come in and make a difference with products and how that system works. And I think a video with the poverty cure, for example, that the Acton Institute has done is a very effective way of telling that story. And so I think as we get, uh, as we get more and more people to realize that there's another side to the government intervention story, I think we're going to have those documentaries, maybe even movies. I think it would be fascinating. And it's I agree with you completely. It's a, the, the best way to break into pop culture is with a movie that tells a story like that. The message is irresistible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Folsom. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. 
Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.